thank you all. Um, it, I'm very excited um, to be here. Communication is near and dear to my heart, having experienced, as Graham said, fire event, flood event, evacuation event, earthquake event, and then active shooter with hostages three and a half months ago. Each one of them a very different situation requiring a very different kind of communication. Um, and all of us are here because we have experienced um, different kinds of events. And uh, what James said initially, our, our constituents expect, um, at, at the very um, heart of it, they expect communication from us as well as, as another, um, as well the other, all the other things um, that we do. And uh, I think our last speaker, um, the last panelist, was a perfect segue um, to this, and because he said communication is at the heart of it. Uh, because of those five experiences in four months, and four years and four months, I'm living in an entire county <laughs> that has anywhere, um, sort of like Lake County from the fires, um, some form of PTSD. So anytime anything happens, next door lights up, um, Facebook lights up, people want to know what's happening. The Pawnee fire that's only 35% contained right now in Lake County has a big cloud over in the north part of Napa County. So everybody thinks that something is happening with us. Um, so th this is a really Im important conversation. And I'll just put in here, thank you, Cal Fire folks, for being here. But one of my big communication um, issues I'm going to be working on is how you all name your fires. <laughs> the Valley Fire in Lake County, everybody thought Napa Valley was on fire. The Painted Cave Fire, I have no idea where the Painted Caves are. And then my favorite is the Butte Fire in Calaveras County, I think. Anyway, so, so we need to, speaking of communication, we need to, to work on that. I'm very lucky today to be joined um, by two experts in the field of disaster communications. Uh, the agenda says there are three, but uh, uh, Chief McElroy was called away to a family illness situation, unfortunately. So we're delighted um, to be joined by these two gentlemen to my left, your right, as you face us. Um, our format is going to, have a, to be a 10-minute presentation by each panelist um, with their background and current efforts, and then we'll do question and answers. And so to introduce these folks, first we're going to hear from Kevin McCowan, uh, OES manager for Ventura County. Kevin is uh, currently the OES manager for Ventura County, and Ventura County OES was partially responsible for disaster response to California's largest wildfire, the Thomas Fire, in December 2017 and January 2018 causing the evacuation of over 100,000 people, destroying or damaging over 1,300 structures, and severely damaging the watershed in Ventura and Santa Barbara counties. And then we'll hear from Eric Sternad, who is the 211 Ventura County Interface Children and Family Services Executive Director, which operates the 211 Ventura County, and provides information and referrals for Ventura County Health and Human Service programs through phone and texting. So, looking forward to hearing from both you gentlemen. Please go ahead, Kevin. Thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, thank you all for the opportunity to come speak to this distinguished group. Uh, on behalf of Ventura County, I'd like to, to acknowledge and sincerely uh, thanks to all of our partners that came to our assistance in our time of need. So, a lot of people in this room had organizations uh, that helped respond to the Thomas Fire. We had over 8,500 first responders engaged in the event uh, from the beginning. So, uh, sincerest uh, thanks from our county to all of you. Uh, also, it's a really beautiful day out there in Santa Barbara, so if I see eyes going over to the ocean, I won't be offended. Um, so, I wanted to dive right into the deep end on communications, and it's a really large bag, and I'll try and unpack it the best way I can, but it will probably get messy, uh, because there are so many components as it relates to disasters and communications and how they intersect. Uh, the, the key highlights I wanted to, to discuss, though, really range around that initial period of time when an incident occurs, and a lot of the, the 
best practices we implemented during the Thomas fire uh, are really all hazards based. They, they can be applied to any one of uh, many disasters that have the potential to impact Ventura County. And I think that's one of the strengths that came from our disaster communications. Um, and then really the second kind of key point that I wanted to make was that there is no silver bullet to communications during a disaster. It's, uh, it's a labor of love and it's a labor of love that takes place a lot more during the blue skies than it does during the disaster itself. So I want to dispel any rumors that there's a, a piece of technology out there or a system out there that's going to, to solve your communication problems. Uh, it's not true. It's like anything else in life when we communicate, it's hard. It's the reason why after every after action review, the very first comment that comes up is we did bad at communicating. Um, it's because it's, it's probably one of the most challenging things we do as people. And it's only exacerbated by a disaster. So uh, with that, I'll just dive right in. Um, the Thomas fire started at about 6.30 p.m. on a uh, Monday night. And the challenge with any, any incident that occurs, you know, during an off hour period of time is there's this latency for you know, your system and your resources to build up. So you have your first responders who are gonna deploy out right away. But given the conditions that we were facing, we knew right off the bat that that wasn't gonna be uh, adequate to, to deal with this particular event. Uh, we had significant red flag conditions going on. So we had in the area where the fire occurred, uh, some gusts reaching 70, 75 miles an hour, uh, relatively low humidity in the single digits, and it started right in an urban interface. So it was right above the incorporated city of Santa Paula. And it just started ripping along a mountain ridge all the way towards the city of Ventura. And it traveled approximately uh, 13 miles in little over four hours. Uh, so to give some people some, what, what that really means is uh, we had a division chief from our fire department who's probably one of the most experienced wildland firefighters in our state who was our ops section chief for the, uh, our operations section chief for the incident, uh, was rolling code down one of our roads that is right along that ridge. And the fire at some points was outpacing him with his lights and sirens on. Uh, so to give some gravity to the extent of what we were facing was just a really significant fast moving fire in an unburned fuel bed. We don't even have records of that fuel bed having had previous fires of significance dating all the way back to the 20s. So we had all of the conditions set for a really significant event. And then I won't go too much into depth because we can read all the different news stories about the, the full breadth of the incident. But what I wanted to talk about in the communications aspect was um, we knew early on, and this goes back to my point about the labor of love during the, the non-disaster times, we had established priorities and goals within all of our different agencies, so the fire department, the sheriff's office, the office of emergency services, our administrative departments, um, cities and county special districts, that when we were confronted with this type of, uh, of a disaster, that one of the very first things we were gonna do was going to uh, aggressively evacuate areas. And contingent upon that is good disaster communications. So I'll spend a couple minutes just talking about that portion of disaster communications. And then I'll go into what I consider more passive forms of communication or uh, emergency information and as opposed to emergency notifications. So one of the biggest topics over the past um, six to eight months has been emergency notifications, alert, and warnings. And this is a, a result of our Northern California fires and our Southern California fires and how we exploit and utilize our different tools. And in Ventura County, our emergency notifications and how we communicate people to take action uh, when they're confronted with a, a life, you know, a life altering disaster is uh, really to have redundant system and a multi-layered system. And if you are falling short in either one of those capacities, you're probably going to start having some significant issues with your emergency communications. Disasters, we call them that because bad things happen and things go wrong. And that's where redundancy comes into play. So early into our fire, we actually had two fires that merged into one. 
um, we lost a significant amount of power, or we lost power in a significant amount of our community in the Upper Ojai area. Um, that really impacts because a lot of people now have uh, voice over internet phones that rely on electricity. They might have cell phones um, that are that uh, their batteries drain really rapidly when they're in the back country because they're drawing uh, the the signal. There's a lot of components that go into how we communicate via telephone, email, cell phones, and all of those things. And they can be impacted by just one single point of weakness. So if the power goes out, for example. So redundancy is key because you can guarantee that at any one point in time, one of your tools is probably not going to be available. And so having those redundant tools in place is what covers the gap that gets created by having that, that single point failure. Uh, the second part is multi, uh, multi-faceted uh, uh, process. So we're a big believer in Ventura County that, you know, uh, we, uh, well, I would go to the point of saying we're not a one-size-fits-all. So we don't, we don't have the process in place that says we're only going to utilize this tool and everyone should comply with that type of tool. So whether it's a wireless emergency alert or telephonic notifications, we look at it as, uh, we're here to provide an overarching service to all different types of groups or constituents. And that might be vulnerable populations that need uh, a certain type of notification. So for example, if you're out in the middle of our back country, the best way for us to usually communicate to you uh, is through in-person notifications. So we, we, we really rely on a graduated um, and uh, uh, multi-tiered a notification process that goes all the way from notifications in person with, with first responders, PA systems on aviation units, all the way through our more technological components such as uh, our organic system that we use in Ventura County is called VC Alert. It's like a third party uh, provided system that does mass notification to emails, uh, reverse 911 data, telephones, all that kind of stuff. And then we, uh, based on the size, scope, and complexity of the event, we'll exploit other tools like the emergency alert system and the wireless emergency alert system. And just one last point on the tools. Um, I think it's critical for people's success to define what they want to use that tool for. So in Ventura County, prior to the Thomas fire, as we were prepping for tsunami evacuations and some other, uh, like I was saying, all hazards type approaches, we came to the conclusion that wireless emergency alert, based on its constrictions or constraints of the system, uh, and EAS, the emergency alert system, they're really uh, uh, attention grabbers. They're not alert uh, action oriented tools because they don't provide you with the specificity that's needed from our perspective to take action. But they're great at giving you the notification to grab your attention. And we had set those kind of uh, paradigms in place. I'm not saying that what we do is the right answer. It's just a way. Um, but what I think is the right answer is for you to have those defined parameters of how you deploy those tools and in what circumstances. That way, during the heat of battle, you're not trying to come up to that conclusion right then. Um, so identifying your tools, what their weaknesses are, but then more importantly, how you want to deploy those tools is really the key for sec uh, successfully implementing them. Uh, the last bit I wanted to just uh, talk about is the passive communication component. Um, so these, everything I was discussing before we consider active because we're pushing that information out to you and you don't have a choice whether you're going to get it or not, right? So if you're getting a VC alert or a wireless emergency alert, it's active communication on our part. We're pushing it to you and we traditionally only do that because it's very intrusive if there's an action associated with it. Evacuate now, shelter in place, uh, that kind of stuff. On the passive communication, that's really the communication that is giving global awareness to the event that's going on. And with that, we, we use that same perspective of having a very robust, multi-tiered uh, system in place. And it, it goes on social media, traditional media, uh, websites, um, and then, and we can't in this day and age just go all technology. We still have to keep our legacy practices in place too. Um, for example, 
sandwich boards, the big wooden boards that we place on the side of streets or at community meeting halls that have just paper maps and uh, written out publications on them, those are critical to certain areas because they might be out of, out of power. So um, we continue to stress that even though we are evolving technologically, we can't uh, disassociate ourselves with the way we used to do things. We have to keep those things incorporated. <laughs> And that was something that I found, uh, that I found to be a, a very successful aspect of the Thomas Fire. We had um, some really isolated communities that had no way to get access to technological resources. And really, they were kept informed by having fire public information officers and sandwich boards deployed to you know, meeting places, uh, areas of safe refuge in those communities. Um, and that, that turned out to be a critical component. Um, as it relates to websites, I always like to share this, and, and our former IT director, but now our assistant CEO is uh, grinning at me, but um, our website crashed, and this goes back to our redundancy factor, it crashed early on in the incident because of the amount of, of information that, or we were, we were uh, pointing people at our website, and it was coming in at a volume we had never seen before. And we had analytics up on one of our display boards showing us, and then all of a sudden it went down. And it went down at a horrible period of time, right? I mean, it's always a bad time, but this was literally horrible because it was about 15 minutes before our fire chief, sheriff, and supervisor were on a press conference that were going to tell everyone to go to VC Emergency for more information. And um, one of the things that we put in place, and it's a big philosophy I live by, which is right people, right place, right time. When it comes to disasters, you have to have the right people in the right place at the right time. And no matter what problem you're, you're presented with, if you have those three ingredients, you'll find a solution. And in our EOC, we have the right people. We have people from IT services. We have PIOs. Um, we have people monitoring our analytics. And when that crashed, within 15 minutes, we had a, whole, a fully different website mirrored to everything that we had from our previous website. And so what felt like a horrible amount of time to me, and I was probably losing some hair, uh, ended up being, in the duration of the entire incident, minute. And we really didn't see very much um, significant impacts from that disruption. But if we didn't have the right people in the right place at the right time, we would have had uh, a major problem on our hand. Because muscle memory in Ventura County is we direct people to that website for all of our hazards. So VC emergency is like common terminology in Ventura County. And for us to have had challenges with that would have been significant on our first, um, like on a significant disaster that we had. Um, the last kind of little bits I, I was just going to throw in with that passive communication with the right people, right place, and right time is uh, train and deploy your tools. It's that labor of love. Uh, we practice train and deploy our tools as often as possible. Um, that's so that we're trained and, and comfortable and confident in the deployment of those communication tools, but it's also to, to troubleshoot those tools and to learn what are their vulnerabilities, what are their weaknesses. And the last bit was um, we, we also go by a big philosophy in our EOC when it comes to communication is, is fight the disaster, not your plan. So all of us love to plan. We all create plans. Um, we tend never to use our plans. And uh, one thing you'll see in incident command or incident management and, and emergency management is this natural tendency to gravitate towards doing something because the plan says that's what needs to be done. And that's what I consider fighting the plan as opposed to fighting the disaster itself. And um, we spend a lot of time in our, in our communications perspective fighting the disaster. Things that we were typically going to implement as we were going through our planning process and we were uh, creating priorities or objectives, we started asking, you know, shooting out that litmus test and asking ourselves, is this really what we should be doing right now? Or is there a better way? And I'll give an example was, we launched recovery, and I'm very proud of this aspect of our county. We launched recovery on the second day, third day of our incident. Um, and we started asking ourselves, how are we going to communicate recovery and response at the same time? That could be very confusing to people not in our industries. Um, and the initial concept was to place the recovery information on the same platforms as we were putting our response information. And that would have been fighting the plan, right? 
hey, that sounds good. We talked about that in peacetime, so let's move forward with it. And instead, we had the epiphany moment, and we were like, hey, we launch a recovery-specific website. Let's not recreate the wheel. Sonoma, Napa, everyone's just gone through this. Their recovery websites are already up and running. Let's start, let's start leveraging successes that other organizations have already implemented. And granted, that didn't fall into this prism of our initial plan, but we fought the disaster instead, and we started uh, changing some of those processes. So that is pretty much what I had prepared to speak, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions when it's the time. Uh, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, Eric Sternad, I'm with uh, Interface Children Family Services. Uh, we're a um, um, multi-program nonprofit in Ventura County, and uh, we uh, run 211 Ventura County, and in contract, we support a lot of other uh, counties across the state. So I guess what I think the perspective I'm gonna bring is from the community side, uh, the partnership with uh, community organizations, and what 211 can do as a partner uh, alongside our um, you know, disaster response and first responders and how we can help be that sort of interface uh, for you uh, in terms of bringing information to the, to the public. So, um, so if I, I'm, I'm a healthy guy, so I don't want to scare you, but if I was having a heart attack right now, uh, what would you do? Well, exactly, right. That took like, <laughs> other than Diane pounding on my chest, thank you very much. I'm not sure what that would do but I was really more happy that someone was dialing 911 uh, and it only took them one second to answer that question. Um, if I was gonna ask you um, where would you find information uh, for housing and, and, uh, and, and food, resources, mental health, what number would you call? 211. So now that's kind of a baited question, but my, my question to you is uh, if you're out in the public, do you think you're going to get that same response? Uh, and I know the answer is no to that. People have, don't, don't really know that there is a single place that they can go to get started with any health and human service. And uh, that's, that's, that's important on a day to day. But, uh, but just following on, on comments that uh, Dr. Rezek said, um, we're finding that 50% of the folks who are calling us today, contacting us today um, around Thomas Fire Recovery have mental health uh, needs, 50%, and that's six months later. So, um, so this is the big challenge uh, and uh, for uh, connecting the public with available resources for them. And, uh, and 211 uh, is, I think, really a, a great uh, um, in, invention and, uh, and something that we ought to really get around uh, and get behind. There's 800 numbers for all kinds of things, but no one remembers any of them, you know, m myself included and all the colleagues that, that, that I work with. The single, the, single greatest res the single greatest referral source of folks directing people to call 211 is from other providers. Right? So the other providers are telling their clients, if you need some other assistance, call 211 and they can help kind of direct you. So that's sort of the basis of why um, 211 is working and it, it is something that I think our communities are investing in. Um, and maybe it is a little bit by accident that we started to come into this role of supporting our, our public uh, uh, partners in, in disaster. But I think uh, Diane spoke to it earlier. Um, we, we expect information and we expect it right now, right? It's in my pocket, I wanna pull it out, I wanna, I wanna do a Google search and I want that information in 15 seconds or I'm gonna be frustrated. That's the expectation that we have. And so um, uh, it, we know that we're gonna be uh, successful with, in 211 if we're gonna take that information load off of the 911 system and so someone's not calling 911 three, four times in a row saying, is that road open now? Is that road open now? That, 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 is really, uh, that really prevents uh, um, the key work that, uh, that the first responders are doing. Um, the other uh, perspective I would set is that um, we really want to try to think about uh, our disaster role as 2-on-1s as very much a before, during, and after uh, role. So, um, of course, all the intensive work is happening during the disaster. But as Kevin mentioned, the, you know, you're going to win that win that battle if you're preparing uh, ahead of time, and that's so uh, so key. And then, as far as two on one's engagement with the community, we really can be that lasting portal for support 
um, way, way past all of the disaster and the formal recovery and the informal recovery is over, and we're seeing that now. We just did a, a, a push text out, and I'll talk a little bit, bit about our, uh, how we're utilizing texting um, as, a, as a great communication tool. Um, we just did a survey recently, 75% of those who responded um, uh, qualified for help in terms of some of the, some of the post-disaster recovery support, but never have applied, 75%. And that just, again, reinforces how hard it is to get the public to really know where to go for help this is, these are available resources that people have donated, that governments have put together, um, and they haven't applied at all because they just don't know that it exists. That's how hard it is, I think, to really get into the consciousness uh, of the public uh, to direct them to help. And again, that's why I think having a three-digit number that's based on that N11 uh, system, you know, 911 and 611 and 811 and 311, having 211 be that uh, source is really, is really key. So, um, so I'll, I'll just show you a slide of, of what 211 looks like. Um, this is, uh, sorry, from our perspective, the, the, the dark blue are all the counties that are in contract with us in, in, in Ventura County. So they, they send all their 211 calls to us. So we have a, a, a large call center. And so we're responding 24 uh, seven. The teal color are after hours uh, um, agreements we have. They do theirs during the day, and we ha handle them after hours and weekends. The, the gray are the other 211s that are live, uh, and then the white counties are the ones that don't have 211. That does represent about 95% of the California population that can dial uh, a cell phone or a landline and reach 211 today. So that's, uh, that's great. That mirrors the country. Uh, California is one of the few states in the country that doesn't have 100% coverage uh, for 211. Uh, so that's something that we're, uh, we're working on. So this gives you just kind of a list of the sample of the type of disaster response uh, issues uh, that, that 211 in Ventura was helping out with. So, uh, you know, uh, flooding in Monterey and, and levee breach issues in various uh, places, the Oroville Dam evacuations. Um, now, we don't cover all those counties. But, uh, but the 211s across California and increasingly now across the country are uh, backing each other up and providing support and offering to help when there is overflow capacity that a, that a local jurisdiction can't, um, can't handle or maybe they can't get their folks in to, to provide help because there are road closures or, uh, or storm events or things like that. So this last year, of course, was really busy across the country. And um, I serve as the uh, co-chair of the, of the 211 U.S. Steering Committee. So I'm working with national 211 uh, partners um, quite frequently. And we convinced the United Way Worldwide to take the role of actually uh, brokering and initiating support from 211s around the country because there are uh, about a dozen or maybe even two dozen centers that are willing to help each other out. Um, and so now what's happening is that when there is a declared disaster, uh, United Way Worldwide is putting out the call to 211s across the country saying, who would like to help out with this disaster? And then we're setting up that you know, information through web portals, uh, and then we're uh, 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 enabling 2-on-1s to help across the country. In California, there are about six centers that are um, using the same cloud telephony provider. Uh, we're in one business unit, so we can literally flip the switch, and then a call doesn't get sent to an agent unless they are ready for that call. So it 100% it maximizes the resources across 211. So that's a nice innovation. We're trying to uh, uh, get that to happen across the country. So, um, so this was a busy year, but it gives you a sense of uh, sort of some of, the, some of the ways in which 211 is helping. Just one other comment. Um, when Las Vegas had their, had their uh, horrendous shooting uh, incident, um, we offered to help. Um, they put us in touch with the coroner's office, and we were actually taking calls from folks who were looking for, uh, for missed loved ones, and we were helping to, and we were actually entering that data straight into the coroner's uh, database, identifying information about each person so that they could then match up with victims or deceased uh, with their families. So there's a lot of different things, obviously, as you, as you all know, that happen during a disaster, um, and 2-in-1 has some flexible capability to be a partner. Um, in a disaster time, we don't give out any information unless that's vetted information. So in our county, uh, unless Kevin tells us this is the information to give out, we don't give that information out. Uh, 
particularly cr uh, critical these days because you know rumors start on Facebook and things like that ha you know happen, and we really want to you know participate in making sure that there's actual vetted information going out. There are definitely kind of those, of course, those three sort of, of buckets to think about how two on one might help your. Uh, community, both in the preparation and the response phase, and then in the recovery phase. Um, if you don't have a two-on-one uh, in your county, um, there uh, is new money that's available through SB 1212 to help you to provision the telecom circuits to build a database. Um, it won't help you with the ongoing expenses forever, but it is money that is available uh, that's that's coming down through the CPUC, and so I would encourage you to to at least make use of that. And, um, and you can talk with Laura Labanet, who's the executive director of, of Two on One uh, California, and, uh, and she can help you with some information on that. But there are definitely some things you can do in preparation, uh, and uh, of course during the, and then the, then the long tail sort of response. So we're happy to, to talk with you uh, about that if that's uh, helpful. Um, so just to give you an idea of, of some of the, some, just preparing in terms of, of public information, um, there's, uh, you know, there's uh, you know, disaster websites that we're setting up to be able to provide uh, conduits for, uh, for the public to go to. Of course, we're doing that in collaboration with our county OES department, but different counties are using 211 and using the capabilities differently, um, and so there is a lot of uh, flexibility to that in the way that you'd like to uh, sort of set that up. Um, I wanted to just show you a little bit about um, um, how, uh, how texting is being used. And so, um, so, I'm, so I've got three examples here, uh, just starting on the, on the right side here, um, uh, is uh, two-way text. So this is happening uh, in, in our center and increasingly happening across uh, 211s across the country where they're doing, in addition to the phone work, they're doing two-way text conversation. Um, I don't know about you, but you know, as soon as my son reached a certain age, uh, I couldn't talk with him on the phone anymore because he didn't use the phone for the phone, right? And, but we continued to have a relationship through text, and that's, that, that goes today. So, um, so this, is, this is actually the way uh, you know, people are increasingly communicating. So, um, so what will happen is that uh, folks can uh, text in their zip code to 898211. That's the text number that's used by the vast majority of 211s across the country, actually. They'll get a, they'll get a, uh, a stock answer uh, coming back. Thank you for responding. In this case, it was in Tehama County. Uh, you know, give us your age, gender, why you're calling, and then we start that two-way text conversation. And uh, what's great about that is that we can then say, oh, you're looking for uh, you know, shelter, then we can uh, put that information in. Now the person has an, in their phone a permanent record of that resource for them, right? So they're not dependent on us in that sense. Now they have that resource themselves and, and a record of it in their phone. Um, the keyword campaigns are really being used in disasters uh, quite effectively. So here's just two example. The keyword was windstorm for this county. Uh, the keyword storm info. In our county, we did Thomas Fire or versions of that. Then after a couple of days, we stood up a Spanish language uh, of Fuego Tomas and then different sort of misspellings of both of those English and, and Spanish versions. Um, and the real uh, advantage of keyword campaigns is that once, a f once folks then have that two-way conversation with you, now you, you know that they're interested in that, and then now you can communicate around the fire, both the, the response and also the recovery phase, um, sort of at will. And that kind of leads us into the push text, which uh, Kevin talked about uh, using, where we can then uh, target information that would go out only to the people who had had typed in, in this case, uh, Thomas Fire earlier. So we know they were interested, so there's no need to try to go to the to TV or print or, or radio or whatever to try to find people. We already know who they are. We have their mobile numbers. We know they're interested in fire response and in this specific one. So one, one example was a great one. Kaiser Permanente came up with some mental health uh, recovery uh, uh, groups and it was only in the cities of Ventura and in Ojai. And so we sent out a push text just to the people from Ventura and Ojai who had typed in Thomas Fire in, 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 as part of the keyword campaign. So this was a targeted intervention that went exactly to the people that it qualified for. We didn't send it to other cities because they, they, they wouldn't have been able to have gone, right? So, so you can see how we can develop ever more specific 
targeted ways of communicating back and forth and um, as we see this long tail of response uh, period to disasters, it's really important to capture folks who are in fact affected and care about the disaster from the very beginning and then to be able to communicate with them. It's by permission. Um, you'll see these things um, are, requ are uh, required to uh, uh, to, uh, to appear, tech stop, to opt out at any time, so it's a permission-based thing. So it also does bypass some of those uh, confidentiality um, sort of barriers that are meant for, for privacy pr uh, reasons, and they're good, but sometimes they can actually prevent people from getting something that's very helpful to them. Uh, so I thought it'd be helpful just to, just to get a sense about how um, texting and the different sort of variants on that are being used uh, by um, you know emergency services, uh, OES departments, and and increasingly by uh, by two one ones. So I thought that might be of interest. So the next uh, the next slide, um, yeah. So what this is um, this is again just uh, a showing sort of a transition over into the recovery phase. And so, um, so in this case, we're you know the key word was VC recovery, and we can we can uh, then start that recovery conversation, and we can build these series of uh, of, of sort of pathways of communication, and this can happen uh, automatically. It doesn't require can can even bypass having a physical person interact at all. It can all be done automated, and so you can get a lot of transactions accomplished. And then we're always giving people the off-ramp to say, if you'd like to convert this into a phone conversation, just dial 211. If you'd like to convert this into a two-way text, then just text in your zip code, and then we'll switch over, and then we'll have a live uh, interaction with them. So it's a nice, again, it has that nicer sort of feature. Um, I put this view in here just so you could see that when the texts are coming in, they're queuing up like this. And so now what we're doing nationally with 211 partners is we're giving access to each other's text feeds. And so now um, my 211 partners from Connecticut uh, can actually go on to the Ventura feed in a disaster and they can pick off the easy ones, right? So someone's asking an easy question, that's a very simple question but needs to be answered you know, many, many times over and over again. Um, they can though, go and peel those off and answer those for us. Um, and, uh, and then that leaves the more complex ones, the ones that require some local knowledge or uh, something like that, they can leave those for us. So you can see how we can, again, and we, we've done this already multiple times uh, over the last year, and this is a way to really deploy the strengths uh, of, of two-on-one across the country uh, for a local situation. So, um, so that just, I uh, thought that might be of interest to, uh, to see how two-on-one's using uh, texting uh, as a way to communicate. And, um, and again, it's, um, uh, you know, the, as the disaster starts to wind down, and we're seeing this now in Ventura County, the issues are, uh, we're, we're, we're working with people now who were very much on the edge going into the disaster, right? These were people who were barely making it as it was. The disaster pushed them over the edge, and then once this disaster phase, the recovery phase is over, then um, what, what, will, what, will the, what will the public have a, a, as, as a permanent resource for them in the future? They'll know that 2-on-1 was a place that they could get connected to mental health, to food resources, to um, um, you know, counseling, uh, et cetera. And, uh, and so that becomes kind of a permanent investment in the community uh, to be able to connect them to the resources that are there. Um, I, I like to think that we, we should be always operating at maximum f uh, efficiency in our social service system. And so if I can make a referral of someone into a program that is taxpayers we've already paid for, but it's only being utilized at 85%, and if I can, if I can get that 15% extra utilization, that's 15% more services without spending another dime, right? And that's, I think, again, part of the part of that long-term uh, uh, effect that two-in-one can uh, can have. So, thank you. I um, before we, um, Kevin has one thing he'd like to add about uh, translation, which was going to be one of the uh, topics. Um, that I hope you would address briefly in what you do, not just with Spanish, but uh, Tagalog in our case. We have a huge Tagalog community in southern Napa County, so, you know, it's not, it can be multiple translation. Um, but I just wanted to toss out a few other uh, topics um, that I, either one of you can respond to. Um, we found with um, three days of no electricity, uh, you can't 
it's great to text if your phone operates, and 60 to 70 cell towers, I think, went out between um, <laughs> Sonoma and Napa and the fires. So we went to radio, and so if you have any uh, co comments about that, I hadn't been on the radio in years, and <laughs> there I was. Um, and uh, what you do about, uh, we had a major um, golf event that had just finished four hours before our fire started, in, and what do you do about all kinds of people who are not even hooked into your system because in a tourist community because they're staying there, um, and, and they were in the immediate evacuation area. Um, and um, the interface between the, the state and the federal government, um, when you have the largest veterans home in the United States in your supervisor district, and 900 veterans who uh, are supposed to shelter in place or not, and 26 ambulances arrived because the state ordered them, but we didn't know it till we saw them coming up the highway, and we still don't have electricity in certain areas where you can't text. Um, and um, how you communicate with the evacuated people, um, but you address that a little bit with your texting, but I think that's really good in how you engage with them later, but not everybody has texting, and you don't know where they've gone. They could be in Sacramento or San Jose. Um, and gosh, I had another communication issue, but I'll let you start with any one or all of those. <laughs> Okay, so I can jump in on the Spanish or on translation in general. Uh, we used to believe a best practice was when we did evacuation orders or those action-oriented emergency notifications that we were doing them in English, and that uh, follow-up information would be available in multiple languages. And in Ventura County, we're predominantly a second language would be Spanish, but we have a, a vast variety of languages. Uh, Tagalog's another really large one, especially around our Navy bases. And um, we started getting some uh, uh, increasing frequency of communication early on in the incident from our community members and that we weren't meeting the, the needs of our community when it came to translation. And uh, going back to that, that phrase I, I said earlier, right people, right place at right time, and fight the disaster, not the plan, uh, we jettisoned our best practice of uh, doing emergency notifications only in English, and we adopted, hey, we can do this in Spanish as long as we have the right people in place. And so we tapped into uh, our employee pool, who's very talented, who have certifications in translation. We wanted to make sure because we have a variety of dialects in our community that, um, and we were getting information from people that certain dialects are misinterpreting certain types of translation. So we wanted to use a baseline and the baseline we used was the, the certification process for translation. And we brought those people into the EOC to provide that translation. We also mirrored our website. Initially we were using Google Translate and that wasn't meeting the needs so we mirrored a website and did it entirely in Spanish. Um, and then lastly, we started uh, acquiring different uh, private sector resources. So we uh, initially went in, uh, we dove deep with this uh, company called One Hour Translate that uh, when we were taxing our translation services that were in the EOC, we could then go online to this One Hour Translate company send them all of our information and within an hour, generally speaking, they would provide us with a certified, sealed translation document that then we could push out to the community. Um, and then to, to talk about, all, and their one hour translate, and then the other service we use is the service that all of our dispatch centers and, and our hospitals use. Um, those have over 150 different languages that they're certified in translating. So we could push those messages out in, in any of the 150 if we needed. Uh, one of the critical aspects of the translation was that we operate in our emergency operations center a uh, emergency hotline that's really integral to our evacuation notifications. And when we push out those notifications, it actually comes on the caller ID and embedded in the message is the phone number for that emergency hotline. So people can call right back and speak to a person in the EOC that has the most up-to-date information on what the evacuation order or the shelter in place order is taking place. Um, and then it also has the link to our website. And so that's kind of how we bridge that translation gap. Um, it was a big lift at first, but it paid dividends in the long run. 
Um, and then as it relates to the question about uh, tourism, we have a, a large tourism uh, uh, population during that time frame in, in the city of Ventura. That's where I'll, I'll refer back to the, the topic of utilizing your tools, uh, knowing their constraints and then utilizing the tools that can overcome certain gaps. And so one of our constraints in our organic system, VC Alert, is that it's a, it's a, it's a registration, a self-registration or an opt-in system. And if you're from Nashville and you're visiting the Ventura area for the holidays, you're, you didn't opt into our system guaranteed, right? So that's where the wireless emergency alert and the, the uh, um, EAS system really come into play because those are uh, non-denominational in the sense that it doesn't matter where you're coming from. It's leveraging technology on where you're, where you're spatially positioned. And so uh, that was one of the things that prompted us to, to utilize our wireless emergency alert early on in the, the first night of the incident was, hey, we have a large population that's going to be impacted by this that will have no other way to communicate. And traditional media wasn't going to get there uh, in the time that we needed. So an aggressive approach utilizing WIA and EAS was, was definitely warranted. Um, and then as it relates to well, people who have power outages and, and radio systems, when we activate our, our, our center, we also bring in our uh, ham operators, our ham radio operators. So they have a, a, a way of, of kind of being a, a different network to push out information. So they were helping us in that. Um, and then going back to the emergency alert system, having people um, uh, get that message, not just on TV, but on radio. Um, and then part of our preparedness campaign, no different than probably everyone in this room, is to, to inform our, our residents and our, our public that there's a level of personal responsibility in disasters. We don't own all of that responsibility. And part of that responsibility is them having redundant ways to receive information. And one of those being that people should have in their disaster kits uh, radios, flashlights, batteries, and all those different things. So uh, we really leveraged all of the tools. Um, and I think from a data standpoint, our, our numbers uh, show that we, I think, effectively utilize those tools in, in the first 12 hours of the incident, we received um, a call a minute in our hotline for that full, for a call a minute every minute for 12 hours straight. Um, we had over 64,000 people under an evacuation order within the first 12 hours. That rose to over 90,000. We issued over 60 uh, emergency notifications using all of the different platforms. Um, and then our way of interpreting how effective the penetration of those tools was, was what amount of hits we were getting on our website, and then the, the phone calls. So over the course of the whole Thomas fire, our, our call center received over 20,000 calls. If they were not response directed, we would kick them to the two on one side. So that's where that partnership with two on run really helps, uh, because we weren't providing a lot of the health and human services information out of the hotline. It's much more geared towards the uh, response actions. Uh, and then our, our website had millions and millions of hits uh, over the course of the, the duration, being the peak one being when it crashed our site that first night. So um, we were able to bolster our servers and get that back online. So hopefully that, that helps. Yeah, so just a couple more comments about the, the language part. So 211s also use the uh, language lines that have the, the kind of full capacity of 150 languages. Um, uh, there, there is no uh, two-on-one in the country that has uh, the entire two-on-one database uh, uh, translated into Spanish, which is really um, uh, kind of shameful given the amount of uh, Spanish language population that we have. Um, the Ventura County Community Foundation uh, gave us a grant to actually do that translation, so we're in process now of doing that. Once that's done, then we'll be spreading that out and offering that out to other two-on-ones to be able to use. So, so that should really help. Um, and we're really encouraging partners to to make sure that they are are pushing information out in whatever threshold languages that they have in their community for the you know coming disasters. And we're making that kind of a national uh, push at this point. Um, so, um, so that's what I'd say on that. As far as the regionalization factor that happens, let's look at the Oroville Dam disaster as an example. They evacuated, I think it was 200,000 uh, quickly folks fled that, that, that county and, and spilled into other neighboring counties. People were calling 211, reaching different 211 centers, saying, 
I don't even know what county I'm in. I'm not really sure where, where I am, what city I'm in. I just, we just fled because we didn't want to be drowned in our car. And um, uh, so I think uh, we're, we're really seeing how key it is to have, to, to build systems that are, that are operating regardless of county boundaries, regardless of, of sort of regional boundaries. Um, if we were to have a major earthquake in our area, uh, undoubtedly the same thing would happen where, where we would be flooding Kern County with folks coming up, uh, up you know, five and 99. Um, so, uh, so I think, you know, building some of these systems that can, can uh, still um, uh, provide information to people regardless of whatever community they're in is key. The, the Las Vegas shooting was another example where we had people, and, and actually the, the mudslides here, uh, we spoke to a lot of uh, concerned family members who were, some of which were saying to us, can I please three-way call you in to talk to my elderly father who's being really stubborn and just because he evacuated two fires, he doesn't want to get out when he's in the middle of a, of a mandatory evacuation zone. So, so uh, I think these are just examples of how um, we're, we're kind of a, a very small and you know, community across the entire country sometimes at this point. And, uh, and 2 one's definitely trying to develop in these ways to be, to be a resource across, uh, across boundaries. Thank you.